Welcome to Experiments in Leadership. I am Sonu Bhaseen. Experiments in Leadership is a space where industry leaders share their thoughts and stories about various facets of leadership. As always, before I introduce my guest, I do want to urge all of you to subscribe to my channel. It has great content and it is free to you, so go for it. Back to the conversation of today. Now, today's guest belongs to that breed of banking professionals who have made their name globally. Surat Chatterjee, my guest today, has been a career banker and has worked with Bankam, GE Capital, and then spent many years with Citibank, where he went on to be the managing director and global head of segments and products in retail banking. Currently, he is an advisor to a few startups and a non-executive director on boards. A person with a wicked sense of humor delivered with a twinkle in the eyes. I am so looking forward to our conversation today, Surat. Welcome to Experiments in Leadership and looking forward to uh, your wicked sense of humor. So, sure. so you have worked across Asia, Europe and America, Surat. Have you seen any differences or similarities in leaders across these geographies? Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, the Almost every country has got a different approach to management. Okay. Uh, it comes from background. It comes from, um, you know, how they've been brought up, you know, the food they eat, everything, right? So it's, it's a very, very complex uh, structure. So mm -hmm. my experiences in dealing with people in Japan, Korea, or Mexico, or Colombia, um, and then United States, um, India, mm -hmm. <laughs> kind mm -hmm. of, I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. And then basically Southeast Asia have been all very different uh, people with different characteristics, um, ego styles, different, different structures. Yeah. And uh, so any any leadership style that stands out for you across any of these geographies? Um, I think it's a function of the scale of what I have done. So mm -hmm. uh, in some ways, you know, if I talk about China, um, my scale in China was so small that, you know, trying to understand leadership traits from me might lead people in so many different ways. Mm -hmm. um, India yeah, is always easy to talk to because I've worked in India and I've, you know, mm. overseen India from multiple perspectives. But yeah. I, I think the point I'm trying to make here is my biggest discovery is when I went to the United States. Uh, yeah. It is by far the largest market in the world, right? Mm -hmm. And it has got the most complex, uh, most litigious and complex um, mm -hmm. management styles that exist. Yeah, uh, it was fun in many ways. It was a massive learning, massive change for me mm. personally. Mm. Um, but then also, I felt good at the end of it. I mean, yeah, that was, that was something special. I, yeah, I think that makes a difference. So you know, I, I mean, you've seen leaders across all these geographies, but in these geographies, you yourself have been a leader. So now, as a leader, which means that you have followers. Uh, so as a leader, in which of these geographies have you learned the most about your own leadership abilities or capabilities? Uh, look, I grew up in India. And mm. so my first lessons of leadership are always going to be India. And mm. given that there are so many Indian leaders around the world, mm. uh, I can pretty much, um, you know, sort of relate to them, whether it's the head of MasterCard or the you know, the Prime Minister yeah. of Eng England, England and, mm. you know, all, all of these people, um, I, I understand them better than most, largely because we grew up fighting for space, mm. fighting for men in a very, very large community, right? Mm. Mm. Um, then I learned a lot going to Japan because that style of management was very different. Um, mm. It was a lot more patience, a lot more, um, mm. on one hand, more autocratic, uh, on the other hand, also very perceptive that, um, you know, people have got strong views and their views might be better than mine. Yeah. Uh, so that was interesting. And then 
I think one of the biggest successes in my life was um, growing a credit card business in Australia from, I think, mm -hmm. 1% market share to 10% market share mm -hmm. in a three-year short time frame. Mm -hmm. um, I learned a lot about Western philosophies and uh, how to convince people. Most, most people mm -hmm. are more driven and mm -hmm. are very successful in the Western style with mm -hmm. their own characteristics they're not guided as in right. asian companies are. and mm. so buying into companies forming partnerships getting my team to understand what i was trying to do mm. um, integrating those companies building out products mm. um, trying to find different ways to fight and gain market share yeah. i thought that was a big learning for me mm. and then going to the united states where Everyone has a sense of intent. They're clear in what they do. They're, mm -hmm. There's no, uh, they may have agendas, but the agendas are normally on the table. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, it's a very different world. Uh, I think my transformation in the United States uh, from being a, more of an autocratic lifestyle leader in Asia Pacific to being mm -hmm. a participative leader. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I think U.S. taught me the concept of how to deal mm. in groups where your opinion is not not the really mm. any anything that anyone else will appreciate, yeah. uh, but still getting results, right? Yeah, yeah. No, I think what you've said and you've described different styles of leadership and uh, the kind of uh, followers, for want of a better word, uh, autocratic on one side and uh, more democratic or consensus building on the other side. I think that's a challenge that a lot of the youngsters who want to make a career globally face, but I'll come to that in a bit. But since this conversation is all about uh, experiments in leadership that worked and you know one that didn't, uh, would you like to start with an experiment in leadership that worked for you? Oh, I'd love to. Um, yeah. I have a pet theory. I'm sorry, but you're going to get bored a bit on this theory. <laughs> A lot of people who deal with me have heard this theory and mm -hmm. um, you left out an important part of my background is that I'm an engineer by background yes. and, a, and a chemical engineer by background. So processes and stuff I pick up from my fluid mechanics class that I attended. Yeah. Um, and then later in life, I learned a concept called Markovian uh, analysis, which is very simply put. Hmm. You consider things in a box, you look at the inputs, you look at the outputs, mm -hmm. and you see the intervening variables over time, mm -hmm. and you try to work with those intervening variables to maximize what you want to get, right? Okay. Um, this has been a very strong underlying philosophy for me, hmm. no matter where I am. Hmm. Um, defining the output was maybe my job. Mm -hmm. I had bosses who also defined the output. Everybody mm. and their uncles and aunts defined outputs. You know, mm. this is where you have to get to. Mm. Uh, one boss told me in a business I took over that, which was making $100 million, show me how you're going to get to a billion dollars profit. Billion dollar okay, profit. So hmm. It's a 9x multiplier. Mm -hmm. it, so you sat down and, you know, got to understand what the output is going to look like. You saw the inputs, you try to tweak it. Markovian theory actually works over time. So you, you look at what input change or what intervening variables that you change resulted in a higher output, right? Mm -hmm. So I gave this billion dollar plan. Mm. And I think six years later, I hit the billion dollar mark. Six um, years, right? Yeah. Six years. Mm -hmm. I hope your boss was happy. Well, not just my boss. I had a conference call where I called mm. every predecessor I had who had done my job. <laughs> More to thank them because, you know, Citibank Cards is such a strong product. Mm. Um, every one of them came on the call and I told them this is what we've achieved. And, mm. you know, maybe mm. I've done some stuff, but you guys did other stuff. And mm. each of them, um, I think I, I got a gleam of uh, satisfaction from all of them because mm. everyone had achieved something, right? Mm. But I, I think the Markovian theory, which I'm going to further expound on, mm. the trouble I had in this particular case is that I had 14 countries. I had 14 managers. Right. The 14 managers reported to me, and they also reported to the country managers. 
Right. And inevitably, it is the question of a budget, mm -hmm. right? You can always do anything if you have unlimited budgets. Yeah. But then I didn't have unlimited budgets. Mm -hmm. And then I had individuals who worked for me who had different opinions and everything else. So this Markovian theory was interesting because I sat with each one of them mm -hmm. and I explained to them their individual Markovian theory. This is what you're doing. This is what you're getting. These are the variables. Mm -hmm. I think the model worked because everyone understood mm -hmm. what I was trying to get at. Hmm. I got agreement. I mm -hmm. had everyone understanding that you change a variable, you're going to head the other way. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, let's face it. I, you needed partnerships. We needed products. We needed salespeople. We needed risk managers. We needed, you know, mm -hmm. everyone to be aligned to this. Mm -hmm. And um, I did come out of a risk background. So the biggest support I got, got was from the risk people. Mm -hmm. um, I had people who were detractors, people who didn't agree with me, didn't believe in me. Right. I had um, bosses who didn't believe in me. Right. Um, and you know, in almost all these cases, uh, change has to take place. If you want to hit the number, mm -hmm. people who are definitely not going to agree with you have to go do something else. Right. Right. And so the painful part of it was some very high performers. Uh, I had to let go to other businesses other organizations, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, I had to make changes. Um, but mm -hmm. as long as I stuck to the variables, and I stuck to what I was trying to change. Mm -hmm. And everyone understood that. Mm -hmm. um, I got, got away with, you know, a pretty strong transformation that took place, right? Right. Um, yeah. I still have a plaque given to me where we trebled our sales volume. We doubled our asset structures. We mm. went down on credit losses. We, mm. Mm. you know, so it wasn't just, it wasn't me. Mm. It was 14,000 people, right? Mm. Mm. And mm. you can get agreement and direction and, you know, uh, everyone yeah. going the same way. The I call these eddies that come against you, waves that come against you slowly yeah. become softer over time. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, City went and bought, sold that business. So <laughs> nothing more to say after. Well, you increased the valuation, I guess. So they would have made oodles of money. But you know, you talked about, I mean, the easy part was getting people who bought into your uh, dream of people who bought into your uh, uh objective and it was easy to work with them but you also said that there were many detractors people within your team and your bosses so how do you how do you deal with detractors and does also the geography where you are have anything to do with it i, I think the american style of baseball is quite uh, interesting mm -hmm. a boss once told me that you have mm -hmm. to give every person three strikes Acha, okay. And people don't agree, they don't change, or they don't get into what you're thinking. Hmm. You have to let them go. Three three strikes, huh? Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. There are times when I didn't obey the three strikes. There are times when I got angry or hmm. upset or frustrated, and I did one strike or two hmm. strikes. Hmm. Uh, and I felt bad because... Hmm. Uh, you know, I think three tries is a very, very important part. There was a mm -hmm. leader in one country who was just opposed mm -hmm. to everything that was being spoken about. Mm -hmm. He didn't believe that this product is going to be successful in the country. He didn't mm -hmm. believe that, um, you know, and he not only made it difficult for me, it made it difficult for people who worked for us mm -hmm. because they saw two conflicts, right? Mm -hmm. So I let him be for a little while. Mm -hmm. um, little while is three years. It's not a small period of time. Mm -hmm. um, every other market grew. He mm -hmm. saw it. He was reminded of it. Mm -hmm. uh, I changed bosses. Um, both bosses told him that mm -hmm. his way is wrong. Mm -hmm. And eventually, the second boss had to tell him that he has to go. Mm -hmm. Right. And it, it wasn't that I had constructed his structure of departure. It's mm -hmm. just that I felt I'd given him sufficient time. Mm -hmm. I'd given him sufficient evidence. Mm -hmm. I'd given him 
enough. And he was a friend. That's the other problem that I had. Mm. Um, mm. To date, he's not spoken to me after that, right? He knows that mm. Um, mm. his conflict with me resulted in him living, in leaving uh, Citibank. Yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, uh, the conclusion was never very nice. Yeah. Um, I had a very bright person working for me, uh, very well known actually for career mm. city bank. Mm. I had a similar experience with him where he just didn't agree, just would not, he would go out and do damage. Right. Um, everybody else working around him would tell him to stop doing it. I would tell him to stop doing it. He didn't listen till one fun morning, he used to report to me. So it was, I mm -hmm. did tell him, look, I'll get you another job in city, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. you I just can't do what you're doing. Yeah. Um, I got a lot of heat from my boss mm -hmm. because I lost him for a long period of time. He knows that he was a good guy. He's a loyal city banker. All these things counted. Mm -hmm. But I said, but you know, honestly, this is not working. So mm -hmm. in any flow of management, you have to understand the detractors. I like detractors because it makes me think. Mm -hmm. So if someone comes up and tells me that, look, I don't agree with this, mm -hmm. I'd like to listen to that theory. Mm -hmm. but once we've gone through the theory, if we can't change to that theory, mm -hmm. and if the Markovian principles don't prove it analytically that mm -hmm. that theory is working. Mm -hmm. um, there was a time when uh, India went through a credit crisis and a credit card crisis where everything was going down. I, I had Mm. People telling me, and India people have ideas. Everyone has an idea. Mm. And it took me a lot of time to sit down and listen to those ideas. You know, mm. we we did um, joint deals with Shop or Stop. We did joint deals with yeah. you know, five other providers. We we were the biggest co-brand uh, structure going. We, we tried to do a deal with Reliance. Mm -hmm. These were all ideas that people had. Hmm. And they weren't working. They just weren't working, right? Hmm. Um, but those detractors were trying to get to the intervening variables. So I did not think that they were not with the model. Right. And so having detractors is good. Listening to them is excellent. It gives hmm. you learning, sort hmm. of improves what you're trying to do. Hmm. But there are people with egos and detractors who are in a position to de destroy the model. Right. And, and to me, those are the dangerous people. And you have mm. to give them three strikes. And then if yeah. it doesn't work, you have to spell it out. Yeah. You, you call them and your American bosses call them three strikes. I call it give enough rope to a person and allow him to hang himself. You know, so you just keep letting them be till you pull it. And, uh, uh, you know, the person has to then deal with it. Yeah, so this was about, you know, detractors and an experiment that worked for you. Uh, what about an experiment that did not work for you? Well, India Cards was an experiment that didn't work for us. India Retail was an experiment that didn't work for us. We never found, I never found, mm. uh, the pathway to becoming, uh, you know, a sustainable model. Mm -hmm. um, HDFC clearly got it right, right? Mm -hmm. Same time, same period. They were opening branches, getting small deposits. Yeah. Um, City was not looking at small deposits, was looking at wealth. Mm -hmm. uh, American Bank looking at wealth in India also was, you know, City was a household name in India. So it wasn't as though my branding was an issue. It's just yeah. the scalability of effort. Mm. Um, it just didn't work. And I think a lot of things went wrong. Control went wrong. Um, you know, operations went wrong. Cost of operations went wrong. Mm -hmm. There were so many variables which just went wrong in my Markovian theory that mm. I would say that didn't do too well. So um, when, yeah. Sorry. So I'm say, I'm asking when you do now look back and cities just sold off their business to access the retail uh, business. Um, so actually, Surat, it doesn't matter if your project does well, city sells off that business. If the project doesn't do well, city sells off that business anyway. Uh, but now that you look back, 
uh, what what could have been done differently for that leadership experiment to work? I think I think the failure was, in some ways, uh, you know, I'm I'm hundred percent involved in that failure is our imagination mm -hmm. and the people getting that imagination. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think the people who led our control functions mm -hmm. uh, didn't understand the scale concept of what we were trying to do. Uh, yeah. There were a lot of my friends, but sometimes what happens is that what works in a market like Japan or what works in a market like Indonesia doesn't necessarily work in India, right? Mm -hmm. uh, India was a scale business. Uh, yeah. It required an outsized amount of budget funding, mm -hmm. it required dedication, it required systems, technology. I, I think we made mistakes with every one of these. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the management principles were that we didn't come together. Mm -hmm. We were skimping when we should have been growing. And mm -hmm. I, in my imagination, had been slightly different than mm. if other people like me, mm. if their imagination had been slightly different. Yeah. Um, remember that we all came from the same background. So yeah. that uh, was not very different or, mm. you know, any of these other city bankers that went and did these big, massive mm. jobs. Mm. Uh, similarly, there's a guy in Singapore, uh, a guy called Desmond Lee. I mean, mm. he's such a friend of mine, but uh, you know, his imagination is similar to mine. I mean, he keeps telling me he's using my mm -hmm. principles in Markovian theory, and he's now the second largest bank in Singapore using the same principles. And yeah. cities sort of scaling down and mm -hmm. selling it off. I, I don't have a problem with city selling a business which doesn't work or a, mm -hmm. selling a business that works really well. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just feel that the individuals I dealt with, uh, one of the guys who work, used to work for me runs this company called Monzo in uh, UK, he's right next door. I mean, mm. almost everything that he does, we, he sort of calls me up and says, do you remember we were talking about this? Um, <laughs> yeah. so it's a, it's sort of a, I, I don't think core principles change, mm. but yeah, mm. um, yeah. I think India was not a success story on my list. It was yeah. not. Yeah. Uh, I would say Taiwan would be a far bigger success for you, or Hong Kong, or Singapore, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. even the joint venture we did in China was fabulous. I and mean, we went to 7 mm -hmm. million cards in two years. That mm -hmm. that scale and that principle of movement couldn't have been very mm -hmm. different from what we're doing, right? Yeah. Um, so it's just that. And I, I think I had another experiment, which was mm -hmm. one of my good experiments, and it still continues to be fabulous. Mm. Uh, after joining retail, uh, mm. global head of segments, mm. we wanted to look at, um, you know, city gold being exactly the same around the world. Right. Unfortunately, whenever you do something like this, city gold means so many different things to different people, right? Yeah. And I spent, I think, out of my 10 years, five years just traveling, talking to people and getting my concept of what the outcome analysis should be. But the United States was such a different, uh, you know, uh, kettle of fish. They didn't believe in it. It's a socialistic country. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of my colleagues felt that the city gold was for rich people. And I reminded them that 60% of the rich people in New York bank with city, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so we have to give something to them back. Mm -hmm. uh, and we did multiple things like open lounges, um, hmm. It came up in the press um, yeah. that the city is doing this, and the absolute wave of people saying this is a wrong thing to do. Right? It is a wrong thing to do to open lounges for rich people. Yeah. Uh, and so wow. we uh, went out and built branches in impoverished societies to counter some of that negative thing that for was city happening. Gold. No, not city gold, but we also open city branches and community oh. areas because mm -hmm. a city in New York is almost like a bank that caters to everything, right? Mm -hmm. and the moment you build these lounges, people start mm -hmm. saying, hey, what about the communities? So right. you had to do both of these. Mm -hmm. City gold got launched in the US, relaunched in the US, mm -hmm. reframed, restructured. Mm -hmm. and it was, uh, in my mind, 
I think we did a 60% good job on it. I mean, if I compare that to Singapore mm. or, or even India, mm-hmm. getting to 60% in the US was a major yeah. influence strategy that I got. Even the CEO of the company was influencing people to shut up and go do what they were going to do. <laughs> Yeah, so you had a supporter there. Uh, so sort of you worked across uh, many geographies, as I said in the beginning. And today, when I look at many of the youngsters, you know, just graduating or working in uh, multinationals and especially banks, they all want to work globally. You know, so India is where they work, but they have aspirations of working around the world what advice or what what can you tell them or what can you tell them to look out for uh, some things to do some things not to do so that they are be- they are better leaders uh, when they go outside of india because like you said india is very different from um, any other market so india and a lot of i'd say let's let's just talk india for a moment or right? the ingredients are very bright people Mm-hmm. Uh, we speak English. We are naturally have the gift of the gab. Mm-hmm. Uh, we can do meetings and we can communicate without any sort of, um, you know, any kind of restraint. Yeah. No, we, we don't hold ourselves back, right? We, we've been taught from school, college, mm-hmm. group discussions we've had, et cetera, in college. Class that, participation, always speak up. Yeah. So mm-hmm. holding us back is not not mm-hmm. not a problem. That's that's actually one of the reasons why Indians do well is because mm-hmm. they speak up. Mm-hmm. Second is that the big positive that Indians have is that uh, they're naturally um, mathematical in their approach. So, mm-hmm. so they work hard and they're mathematical. So you know, mm-hmm. step by step, they mm-hmm. cover things, which is why uh, almost all technology firms around the world now are looking at. Indians as you know CEOs. Yeah. Um, third is we have no baggage. We we're not mm-hmm. we're not we don't carry all sorts of nuances of life with us. We mm-hmm. you know I'm gonna say this badly, but it doesn't matter male or female. When one person goes to work, the other person looks after the house and yeah. uh, you know there's a backup system. There's no mm-hmm. you know parents come and pitch. We have no issues about helpers. We don't have any issues about dragging kids from one school to another school every three years or four years, right? Yeah. So we're very mobile and very mm. good from that perspective. Mm. I think the challenges we have is listening. Mm-hmm. We, we've grown up not listening. Mm-hmm. And even people in India who listen mm-hmm. are in some ways not really listening. I mean, going out and working with some of the markets where everybody listens and they don't talk and they've got agendas and they have mm-hmm. massive aggression going on. Mm-hmm. Um, Japan, Korea, China, um, who can't naturally speak English and therefore cannot communicate well. Um, we have to be aware of that. Okay. And I, I think it's, I've noticed myself, I've noticed a lot of my colleagues falling mm-hmm. flat on mm-hmm. that. Uh, you know, people who are good listeners, Mm-hmm. Um, I know a few Indians who've been excellent listeners do phenomenally well. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that's the quality that needs to look at. Mm-hmm. And I, I think the other thing that we are not good at is scale. Is scale. Yeah. And what is expected of us when we go to other markets is to have the concept of doing things big. But isn't it counterintuitive because India is such a large country and, you know, what is seen as uh, medium size in other countries may be seen as small in India. So how do you say that we are not used to or we don't understand scale? So normally the people that you're talking to and I'm talking to are not people who come from extremely rich families. They don't come from the families that run scale, right? Um, so I'm not talking to the Mittal's kids or the Ambani kids or you know all these people's businessmen who who've mm-hmm. done well and their kids. I'm talking about the people like us who okay. come from a middle class background. Our nuances on dealing with scale are somewhat limited, okay. uh, unless you've actually worked 
-hmm. in a very large company like Tata's and mm -hmm. you're a graduate of TAS and you work through it. <laughs> you, you still don't understand scale because when mm -hmm. you are whatever you're given to do in India is always within a certain scope and space, right? Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of startups today in India doing scale business and doing really well. Mm -hmm. And you know, um, organizations like Nike and stuff like that, I mean, they've come out from people like our backgrounds, but they yeah. had to, there were very few people who could understand the meaning of scale in India. Right. But the average person who's gone through college and has done MBA is chartered accountancy have joined school. The the big shock that comes is with scale. Mm -hmm. um, I got it. I my first ad campaign in the U.S. was a fifteen million dollar sign off. I, I had mm -hmm. and I had never signed a damn check for fifteen million in my life. Right? <laughs> right. In Asia, every country used to do their own stuff. They had their own authorities that never came to me. Yeah. But in the U.S., I had to sign off and. Each of these decisions, you know, were, I, I was thinking small again for a while. Mm -hmm. Why are you trying out something small and seeing, but you can't. These are, mm -hmm. these are mm -hmm. massive markets. Mm -hmm. The campaigns and the businesses you do are, are like massive. Right. So when, when you go into it, the difficulty of this is you've not experienced scale, but you're mm -hmm. seeing scale. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to turn around and think small, yeah, uh, you get sidelined. Mm, right. Um, I I know a lot of tech people who came and gave tech solutions to us in the U.S. and all of them were sidelined because they're such small solutions. Yeah. And yeah. generally, every damn bank has done every damn experiment in the U.S. has failed because mm. of the smallness of what they did. You have to do something massive, mm. right? Mm. That massive means that the gears and the cams that work have got to work efficiently. They've got to have zero impact of, you know, something going wrong. Yeah. If something goes wrong in India, you can employ 1,000 people to correct it. But in yeah. most other places in the world, you can't do that. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. so the perfection required, you know, when you look at Apple and Steve Jobs making his phone and what he writes about as to the effort that went into it, it was mm -hmm. clockwork with no errors. Right. Right. We're not used to that. We look at errors as, okay, you know, we'll handle it. Kind yeah. of, let's do it and we'll find out and handle it. Mm -hmm. Well, no, you need to prepare a lot more uh, right. to handle the scale. Yeah. Um, you've got to have a mental capability to understand that you cannot have customer issues mm -hmm. because litigation comes and hits you harder if you mm -hmm. have customer issues. Mm -hmm. So I think these are yeah. big changes in my own head. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it makes sense to people who are handling it, but they need to sort of yeah. recalibrate this concept of 100% product delivery, 100% yeah. project plans kind of situations. No, I think what you said does resonate. Uh, you know, need to, with all the positives that we have, we still need to learn the ability to listen and really listen uh, and think big, think scale. And also be prepared to uh, to do it right the first time uh, because of, as you say, maybe litigation issues in other countries, which are really not a problem in India. So I do hope that the youngsters who are listening uh, do keep this in mind. Uh, so thank you, Surat. Uh, pleasure as always speaking with you. And I do hope to come back and maybe talk more about specifically the city experiment, but maybe later. And viewers, we will keep having more conversations. So keep watching this space. Till then, bye.